Good afternoon, and as we get started, today's session is on mapping and partitioning of task graphs on hardware software systems. We're going to start off with an introduction to task graphs. Task graphs are computational architectures that allow you to represent an application. An application, as you're going to see later, can be an automotive, can be a networking, can be a multimedia, can be an artificial intelligence, or any combination. Task graphs are made up of two elements, the edges that are the constraints that connect different tasks and the nodes that define the computational aspect of the task. Now, task graphs can be of two types, statistically or dynamically, which is real time. Statistical means that it's a collection of a fixed set of tasks with, with fixed dependencies between the input and output. Dynamic is considered a an asynchronous cyclic graph that captures the execution behavior on a given set of inputs. Now tasks themselves can have multiple input dependencies and they can create multiple outputs that can connect to other dependent tasks. What is the goal when you create a task graph? The goal of a task graph is to try to choose which processor will execute the task, which is the assignment and the uh, schedule, which is when to assign the task onto that particular processor. Now, if you take a view of the task graph, there's really four elements. There's of course the start and end, but you have the different nodes the transfer between the nodes and a series of inputs and a series of outputs. As you can see, there can be multiple outputs and multiple, I'm sorry, there can be multiple outputs and there can be multiple inputs to a task. Now, here are some examples of task graphs that are in a variety of applications, data centers, multimedia, and, and autonomous driving. Notice that some of them are linked through data arriving into the system. Others are linked to sensors and attenuators or act, I'm sorry, actuators that are connected to the processing nodes or the, uh, or the actual tasks themselves. Now, every one of them has different types of dependencies between the tasks. Now, if any of you have any questions as I mentioned earlier, feel free to type it in the task uh, uh, chat window but at the same time, if you have any problems with regards to audio, please let me know and I will change the, uh, the mode or the maybe physically where I'm seated to help you get uh, better audio uh, quality. Now, one of the things you'll notice in task graphs is task graphs, as you can see, have different elements or computational elements that can uh, describe a particular node and different set of edges, which is the connectivity to the next node or the dependent node. Now, the big challenges in designing a task graph are, first and foremost is execution tasks are never the same. There can be multiple small tasks and a large number of large tasks or the other way around. What happens is when you have a lot of smaller tasks, they create significant overhead. Well, if you have a few large tasks, they can block out a number of the smaller tasks. Now, between the large and small tasks, the difference is really the creation and the management overhead versus the actual execution time. Now, when you break down these tasks into these uh, multiple smaller or larger tasks, you are worried about the hardware capacity, which is really about the load balancing. Task graphs are all about two elements. The load balancing, which is how do I assign these tasks to the processing engines? And the second one is how many processing engines do I need? The limitation is always worry about oversubscribing to processing engines, which may create an under or overutilization. Now, granularity of the tasks are really based on a few different elements. Can be your communication or your transfer overhead, can be the uh, overhead in terms of moving from one task to another task, uh, caching, 
can be uh, the uh, identification of the next task, things like that, versus the most important thing, which is the actual processing itself. Smaller tasks result in better load balancing, but of course, you know, the overhead is significant. Again, going back into the startup time, one of the ways you can reduce startup latency is by trying to reuse the processing engines from a pool at the expense of doing additional management overhead. So rather than having it statically defined to different tasks, I mean, different processing engines, you can have it dynamically defined with the, uh, you know, with some management or control overhead. Now, when you look at a task graph, which I'm gonna move over to a model of a task graph, What I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up a very simple task graph that uh, describes a hardware system, which is made up of two processors, a DSP and IO, and it's got two buses connected to the bridge. There are two software uh, tasks defined here or two top software applications. You have the traffic that describes the rate at which these tasks arrive. And then you actually have the real tasks or the nodes and the transitions between them. Now, in this particular case, we have two independent tasks, just for simplicity, but there are ways that you could combine them where you can have dependencies between the tasks. And we're gonna see that in a little bit of time. What we're trying to do is every one of these tasks are assigned to one of these nodes while the transfers is a combination. So for example, here, as you can see, it goes to bus one. But when I go over here, you can see there's multiple of these things to actually reach the next dependent tasks. So what happens when I run a simulation of these tasks? The key thing that happens right over here is I can get a description of the activity that happens in my particular thing, which includes the statistics, the processing activities, the uh, you know the latencies, throughputs, things like that, which we're going to look at in a little bit of time as part of the presentation. Now, when you evaluate a task graph, there are three aspects: the mapping, the experimentation, and the scheduling. As I mentioned, the mapping can be static, which is it maps always to the same resource or can be dynamic, which is using the additional management overhead. There's also the overhead of transfer. One of the things is when you, uh, when you distribute the tasks across multiple processing engines, the overhead of moving the data to the appropriate engine can be significant and can even be more at many times greater than the overhead associated with the actual execution itself. So one of the things you have to be very careful about when you're assigning these or mapping these tasks to make sure the transfer time is actually less than the processing time or significantly less than the processing time. So this is where, you know, when you're applying to number of parallel resources, you want to look at the performance power and storage requirements. And when you're assigning these different, the scheduling algorithm becomes very important. There are two types of scheduling algorithm. The first is the arbitration to determine which resource I need to assign it. The second one is to make sure that the next dependent task is either on the same processing resource or in a close by or adjacent processing resource. The reason is if I have to have any context switching, the, and the transfer time, we can limit that based on the number of hops that have to happen for moving the data for the next processing uh, activity. Now, let's look at the technology story that goes behind evaluation of the task graphs. The benefits of early task graph evaluation, first and foremost is task graphs are created during the proposal stage. So you can really get a full view of the entire system, which is your entire application and how it works on your target SOC or system on chip or data center or an ECU 
or any other electronic system, either integrated or distributed. Now, the advantage of the uh, single environment to view and evaluate it of this task graph is the fact that the dependencies are in multiple locations. There's the sensors, there's the actuators, and there is all the hardware, software, the uh, RF uh, elements, the communication equipment, the antenna, all of them go to enable this task graph. So you want a single environment where you can view all of them. And the reason for that is that you want to eliminate your uh, bottlenecks, your deadlocks, and other surprises. Because one of the things that happens is when you go down to implementation, you have a distributed implementation. The software team works separately. The control team works separately. The hardware team works separately. So it's hard for you to be able to identify those deadlocks down at that level. One of the aspects of a task graph is really doing the failure analysis. Failure analysis can lead to redundancy, can lead to ensure quality of service, and for uh, ability to continue operating even in, in, in the event of any catastrophe or in event of any uh, unintended operation. Of course, the traditional metrics you use for performance and power analysis still apply to a task graph evaluation. <laughs> now, one of the things of a task graph is really breaking down of a task graph. So let's take a simple system that has three nodes in the task, A, B, and C. As you can see here, this one here has a repeatability, which means there are three instances of tasks that are being run here. And as you can see, there are two outputs and there are three inputs arriving to B. There's a single output to B and then the C has two inputs. And again, as you can see, there can be eventually three dependencies. We're not gonna be showing the three dependencies in this particular design. But if you take this breakdown, it essentially looks like this. I've got three tasks. I've got to finish A1, A2, and A3. It's an order. And then I repeat the tasks again, which is my loop here. Each of these generates two outputs and they go out to different tasks, which is the mapping over here, the three. And of course, these have a single output that has goes out to a C. Now, what is important is there's multiple things you're looking here. First and foremost is there's a trigger rate, the rate at which data is going to be coming in to start the task graph. The second thing is the buffering. And the third is the processing time at all of these graph, look, graph locations. So what do you see here? You have a graphic generator that generates it. There's a queue before these tasks can start executing. Why is that required? The queue is required because if this is busy, I do not want to have something starting to feed into that node because typically the nodes are only the processing engines. There's no buffering. So you have a pre-buffer. Similarly, one to come out of this node or what we call the ending, there's some sort of a processing time. So when I go ahead and uh, run a simulation of this particular system, I can generate a variety of statistics. The one that I'm most interested is really the buffering, the input buffer, because the data is coming in, it's starting to get buffered. More buffering means latency is higher, and I'm also not meeting my throughput. Of course, there is also the portion of evaluation of task time, the trace, you know, what is the sequence that it goes through, uh, all of those elements as well. But the key element is really the buffering right over here, and what is the latency time it takes to complete it. What we're going to do is we're going to change the rate at which the data arrives here. So I'm going to make it from like one microsecond, make it 100 nanoseconds. How does that impact my system? Notice even though I moved it 10 times, the buffering didn't go up all that much. It went up to about a max of about seven. So we know that the system, if we add a little more speed up in say uh, the C here, 
So he see here, I've got E minus six. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it, uh, you know, 0. 0.5. So it's like 500 nanoseconds opposed to one microsecond. And I'm going to go ahead and rerun it. You can see there's no impact here. But now let me change this to where I'm going to make it, you know, 100 nanoseconds, the same rate which data came in. Again, there's no real impact. So I know that. This one has an impact on the buffering, but the, uh, the last state, the C1, has no impact. So what I can do is I can start looking at the processing time on these individual elements. So let me change um, A1 to see what happens. Ooh, this gives me a completely different view here. So you can see I reduced C1, nothing happened. I reduced A1, and you can see you know, how the profile goes up and down here. Now I can try to reduce A2 as well. Let me make that 120. You can see the profile changes. So what you're seeing now is diff changes in the traffic rate, the buffer size, the latency to the task, the, the ending operation. All of those seem to have a significant difference in how the buffer occupancy happens. So this, the, uh, the scheduling, the mapping, the dependencies, all play a significant role in how you uh, decide on the behavior of your task in terms of the buffering, the latency, the power consumption, all of these kind of attributes. So now going back to the system here, once you break it down, the important thing is the scheduling, the mapping, the data input rates, and the queuing. All of these have to be taken into consideration to get a good view for your task graph. Now, let's take a step back and try to understand what happens before a task graph is created. Before a task graph is created, you collect all your requirements. With your requirements, you assemble up a multiple one or more task graph. Each one can be typically a sensor, some processing, and an actuator but it can also be other systems or other operations. We're gonna discuss some of those later. You create a rough architecture, which is you got two CPUs, cache and a RAM and a bus, a very simple architecture. So what do you do? You assemble the task graph, you map the task to the task physical system, you generate reports and you keep re repeating it with different variables and different parameters to optimize the, uh, the process, the mapping, the scheduling and the uh, you know, the, the latency. Out of this comes up three things, an optimized architecture with the mapping, the documentation, and a platform where you can run more refined or more detailed explorations. Can be a, a bug that you find in the field that you want to reuse or something which you can use for sales or marketing where you can demonstrate the behavior of a particular application to a target customer application. Now, the types of tasks can be many. So you can have a network of systems where you can talk about the ping-ponging between different uh, nodes. Uh, can be hardware, uh, can be a semiconductor, can be software, which is probably the most common type of task graph, which is typically the uh, SysML, UML. But you also have other types where you can combine DSP imaging, mixed signal, and other types of behaviors in multimedia, wireless communication, or other types of activities. Now, one thing to remember is how will you evaluate your task graph? Your implementation doesn't really change. The process of implementation continues to use the tools that you're comfortable and you're familiar with. What changes is that there's an overview that knows exactly what is happening in all the independent uh, implementation segments. Now, let's take a physical or a cyber physical system and assign a mapping of a task graph onto the cyber physical system. So this is a UAV, it's a drone, and you have different states and you have transitions between the different states that are triggered by decisions that are dynamically made. So it's not a static, it just has these four states but there are decisions can be made using a joystick or it can be a pilot or it can be fully automated. Now, every one of these triggers different subsystems over here and the behavior really 
will impact what your hardware software modules are, what should be my data link, and other attributes such as, you know, how much of power uh, do I need for my system? You know, what should be my RF data downlink? But also, there are other aspects that are need to be taken into consideration. For example, what is the thermal impact? Like as a result of the power that's being consumed by the system, you know, what is my cooling cost? What's my packaging? All of those also get to be evaluated when you try mapping of the dash graph onto the cyber physical system. Now, the attributes, typical attributes that you saw earlier was what is the latency for each one of the states? <coughs> the second one, was really the behavior and the capacity. Can be a variety, can be power consumption, link margins, can be the utilization, can be processing delays, uh, can be a whole lot of different attributes. Last but not the least is what is the energy and power consumed. These are the three main metrics that go to form how you explore or evaluate the task graphs. Now remember, there are secondary attributes like weight, size, cost and other aspects as well that, play, that have an impact as a result of the decisions you make here. Now, one of the things that's overlooked but in a cyber physical system is very critical is really failure analysis. The reason failure analysis is very important is because you're scheduling decisions, the oversubscription of the processing engines, the transfers, all of that have an impact if you take the failure analysis into evaluation. For example, the hardware, you might add a few more cores or you might have multiple memory locations or multiple SSD storage. Software, you might uh, utilize a different scheduling algorithm. Uh, you might have redundant uh, databases to ensure that you never uh, you know, lose or you uh, lose some data or get corrupted data or for example, an extra task occurs as a result of the, uh, the, the uh, task table getting manipulated. Similarly, on the network, you don't want to be in a situation where task one complete, but task two, the network is bro broken. So you want redundant paths to get there. Of course, the operating system has a major role because that's the one that actually does the scheduling. And of course, the power to the system, either you have multiple sources or you have multiple uh, oscillators to ensure you have high quality power into the system. Any combination of things will actually help you mitigate the power. Now, I'm gonna start off with three different applications. One's a cyber physical system, another semiconductor, and third is an autonomous driving application in a vehicle. Now, we take a system block diagram, in this case, the radar, you notice it's made up of a number of, uh, of uh, functions that are uh, in this case, primarily DSP functions, but they all have different variable amounts of inputs and outputs. And these input and outputs gets mapped to different devices in my particular system. So you can see you know, my in and outs where they go. So for example, this one goes here, but this one goes to a different subsystem. You can have any combination of those kind of elements. So why is that important? The reason that that is important is because of the fact that uh, you have uh, the dependencies and the dependencies determine you know, what, how you allocate your different resources. Remember we talked about the, uh, the transfer time versus the additional management overhead, the uh, context switching time. The, how you create this task graph has a huge dependency right there. So here's a block diagram of a model that you might create to describe your radar uh, application. So you can see some of these are, you know, the RF domain. Some of them are primarily storage, while other ones are in your BSP or digital domain. And of course, the key element here is your dispatcher, which is the mapper that tells you where each of these tasks get mapped. So for example, over here, I've got a hardware, which is uh, getting mapped, uh, you know, the, the dispatcher maps it to different hardware resources, which in this case is a single process, so it's a single board computer. While on this case, 
It's actually a TIDSP, which has got multiple clusters. There's four clusters of, the, of DSP cores that I'm mapping them onto. So which means, as you can see, there's significant amount of overhead in terms of moving them between the different, so you got a bridge that can move them across a PCI from one cluster to another cluster. So my next uh, task is running on a different cluster. I've got to move all the data across. In this case, single processor, so single memory, so, it's easy, so there's really no overhead related to the transfer. But these are dedicated DSP functions, and you can essentially you know, um, uh, do parallel computation. So for example, I could be doing uh, the function two on, um, on the third uh, uh, matrix, while I could be doing the uh, target separation on the first matrix. And with the DSP operation, I can uh, you know, distribute them across these different resources, while on a processor, they always have to be sequentially scheduled. So I have that concurrent versus sequential scheduling. Statistics-wise, you see a variety of diagrams here. We're gonna only focus on the throughput. As you can see, running it on the DSP versus running it on a single board computer, the single board computer is always flat because it's very sequential. While here, because the variable rate, the data is coming in and the availability of multiple resources, you see a difference in the execution. So one of the key things to also consider here is to look at the timing diagram to understand what is the processing usage? You know, how efficiently are the DSPs versus the cores within the processor being utilized? So you can get a better feel. Also remember the DSP is running at a significantly slower speed than the particular processor. At this point, I'm going to uh, give a break to answer any questions that people might have. So if you have any questions, feel free to enter them into the uh, chat window. Now, moving on to example two. This one here is all about looking at mapping a multimedia application onto an SOC. In this case, we're using an ARM-based SOC with multiple external memories and uh, with, my, with an external L2 cache and some hardware accelerators. The goal here is we want to be less than one watt of power. We want to get 13,000 frames in that 20 millisecond. 20 millisecond is the frame time. So what are the types of exploration? So we've got this multimedia sequence. We want to first try to implement everything in software, then move some of them to hardware, then add power management. So that's kind of the three steps you want to take in this kind of, a pro of a execution. So if you look at this, I've got two scenarios. I've got this one here, which is, it's got a sequence of, uh, you know, the uh, uh, nodes or the, uh, and the edges between them. And there's also a completely independent operation right over here. Now, this case, the, we talked about the three scenarios. Scenario one is where all of these get mapped to the arm. Scenario two is where I'm taking this partitioning candidate and applying them to a hardware accelerator. Scenario three is taking the power management and determining who, what are the re devices that are consuming the most resources or the most power resources, and then doing a reduction in the, pro, in the uh, power during the periods when it's not active. So now, variety of statistics that can be generated, we can look at the MIPS, the instantaneous and average power, the NPN latency, but also detailed statistics on the different devices that you might have in the system, plus detailed power information as well. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to move over to a modeling environment where I'm going to bring up a demonstration system and uh, there's a question that's come up so I'm going to uh, try to answer the question while I bring up the system. There's an interesting question that's come up with regards to minimum, uh, 
minimalization or miniaturization of critical step path. So what happens in a real system is you can uh, take critical paths and break them down into sub uh, subtasks. So for example, we had shown you earlier where you, know, you had a sequence and you broke it down into smaller tasks. Now, this uh, modeling approach does not handle the miniaturization automatically. Um, what we do allow you to do is allow you to create different variations of the miniaturization and then you know, look at how the mapping and the scheduling occurs. So that is what this webinar is about. Now, what I can do is take this offline and discuss the uh, critical path evaluation to see how you could uh, do analysis in terms of the miniaturization. So unfortunately, I'll not be able to answer the question right now, but I can take it offline and answer the question later. So in this particular case, as you saw was a design where you have the ARM subsystem, you have a series of uh, you know, the, uh, the different, uh, uh, you know, different tasks that go to form the multimedia versus calling function. So I'm gonna go ahead and run a simulation. And the key elements, we're not gonna look at all the statistics. We're only gonna look at two key statistical uh, elements. Uh, we're not gonna look at the timing diagrams or the power or any of those attributes. We're really only gonna focus on two aspects, the instantaneous power and the uh, ability to analyze how many matrices were completed within that 20 milliseconds. We just ran the simulation 20 milliseconds. We noted, that we're at about 13,000 um, frames per second, but the, uh, the power is at 1.4 watts of power, which is about our one watt of power target. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna move this where this particular candidate, and we did some analysis in advance, we're not showing you that right now, and we're gonna move that to more of a hardware. Same, our, graph, but we're going to move the uh, one particular element alone to the, uh, to the hardware platform. And we're gonna see you know, how that impacts the overall system. Again, we're gonna to continue to run it for the same one. Now what we're noticing is we went from 13,000 to 27,000, doubled up performance just by that one critical element in the task graph, but a power yanked up to 1.6 watts of power. So what we've come to realize is, if you want to get over the 25,000, the only way we can do it is we need accelerators. But unfortunately, the one watt of power is not really feasible. But we're going to try to see if we can get the power consumption down right over here. And the way we're going to try to do it is we're going to use, we're going to focus on that one hardware accelerator, because only when we added the hardware accelerator, the power really went up. So we're gonna to try to create a power management where we're gonna say if it's a standby for one millisecond, we're gonna move it immediately to idle state, which is a really low power state. So we're going to rerun the same design and try to evaluate what happens to the performance when we go to a lower power level. What we're gonna notice here is that the power is no longer at 1.6, but it wasn't in the software, it's somewhere in between. So we're at about 1.45 to 1.5. The good thing is this hasn't really impacted the performance. So we got the power down, didn't change the performance. But one thing we realize is we have to have a 1.5 watt power budget. The one watt of power is not gonna be feasible. So using this, you can evaluate what is the validity of your particular task graph. Now, obviously, you can change the task graph, try other experiments, and then see what the performance can be. As the gentleman was asking about the critical path, we can also look at identifying where the bottleneck was. So for example, over here, if you notice, this one had the low, lowest point, which means that I need to worry about the, uh, you know, what, what was happening there? What were the tasks that are being active 
at that point. Now, obviously, there are additional statistics that are generated. For example, I can look at you know between 0.6 and 0.8, and I can notice that there's a number of uh, activities going on right here. Where if I put the dots, if I put various, I can see you know how many devices are turned on. So you can see over here that there's multiple uh, tasks in the graph that are requesting for resources or requesting for processing resources. And that is a major cause of this particular uh, problem where we're not able to hit over the 27,000 mark, we're way below that. So something to also consider to understand that that is the major point of bottleneck. And again, as talking about the redundancy and reliability and also oversubscription of the processing resources, this is something that can be used to take into consideration to determine how I can uh, eva how I can get better performance of this task without increasing my cost. Now, looking at the third example that we uh, discussed, it's really about mapping um, autonomous driving applications onto AutoSAR systems. AutoSAR is a preferred operating system in the automobile space. And really there's a concept of where the, order, the operating system provides kind of a buffer between the hardware and the communication resources and the actual software tasks. So which means that the software tasks can actually run independently of the hardware platforms. So I can go from like, say an, um, a processor which is provided by uh, vendor A to a processor provided by vendor B or a pro, uh, ECU, which is an electronic control unit by uh, in one vehicle was an electronic control unit in another vehicle, which may be connected through different types of networks. So if you look at it, I've got three tasks. Two of them are here. One of them is on this one and they're connected through a network. Now, within each one of them, I have a different number of tasks. And uh, what I'm trying to do here is to create a task tab that shows you the connectivity between them. Now, what is critical over here, and I'm going to go over to the modeling environment again. I can show you how this operates. Is this. So what we've done is we have now, if you remember the earlier ones were always a software or an application view of the world. Here, what we're doing is more of a network view of the world. So what we're seeing over here is the fact that, now I've got a network over here, it's actually a linear network. I've got sensors and I've got one here, which has got the hardware platform. So it's got the easier hardware operating system and it's got all the different applications. To understand really what are the different tasks, there's a table here that tells me, as we saw, there were three tasks with uh, sub nodes within each of the tasks. And then there is the, uh, sorry. there is the uh, trigger points, which say, you know, what time each of these tasks get triggered. And then there is the uh, different tasks and the time within those triggers. And also you can see the dependencies within those tasks as we saw in the uh, task diagram, uh, uh, task graph earlier on. So here what difference is that we're defining the task in the form of a table, not in terms of a graphical diagram. Why is that significant? A lot of times you have tasks that might run in, or task graph that might run into hundreds, maybe thousands of nodes. Graphically instantiating them gets very expensive, especially when they have lots of dependencies on the input and output sides. So what has to happen is you need an alternate mechanism to describe your task graphs, and this becomes a nice alternate mechanism. So for example, when I run this here, what I'm gonna focus on in this particular case is only two aspects. One is you can see I have two uh, ECUs, which are two processors. And you can see the blue, every blue dot corresponds to one task executing on the resource. At the same time, the red one indicates all the tasks executing on EC1. Now notice over here is I've got the utilization and the length, the queue length on each of the tasks. So notice now the queue lengths are pretty low, close to maybe two or three, while the uh, 
processor two has got about 80% plus, but processor one is about 20%. What we're going to do is we're going to introduce failures into the system, or more than failures, it's actually a, kind of an intrusion into the system, which means there's an external device that is actually causing some errors to call, happen within this particular system. So in this case, there are two types of errors. One is it dynamically goes and alters the task table, which means your task graph has changed. And the second one is reducing the speed of some of your resources. Go ahead and run it again. Now, notice how this one changes where what ECU2 was doing most of the processing. Now you can see ECU1 is doing most of the processing. But here's the thing that's important. Earlier on, the queue lengths were pretty low. But notice now, we got, it, we got the queue length constantly increasing. And both of them are now 80% plus. This one's almost 90% plus. If I look at this, you okay, notice it's close to 95%. Obviously, you reach steady state right over there. But you can see, yes, it can be processed, but there's always a risk that if, if something else changes, there's a risk that the system may actually not function properly and may even lose data. So using this, you can actually evaluate extremely large task graphs, running the hundreds of nodes with multiple dependencies between all of them. So this is how you can evaluate very complex task graphs using just a table. Now, a quick introduction to uh, Mervis Design. Uh, company's been around since 2003, but we've got a variety of customers across a large number of application areas uh, that are looking at building these graphs to evaluate the performance and power consumption of their system. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the goal is you first visualize your task graph, you explore it against the hardware platform, and then you collaborate to be able to evaluate the entire, if you remember originally talked about different parts of the system get implemented differently. So here you have an ability for all of those teams to collaborate within a single platform. And of course, I mentioned, you can have an end-to-end -end behavior, you can do safety analysis, power and performance. Now, one of the things with task graphs is task graph is a pretty complex exploration. Drawing a task graph is very easy. You can draw it with Visio. Exploring the task graph is a lot more complicated because depending on who you are, you might want to do it at a more uh, stochastic manner where you're looking at MM1 queuing to someone that wants to do it at a cycle after which they need to know what happens in every clock cycle. So how do you evaluate the task graph? That's an important consideration of your particular uh, design or your particular uh, evaluate exploration. Now, Mirabless Design as a company provides a variety of services. We can provide you the tool and you can go build the models and we provide training or we can develop custom task graphs, custom hardware platforms and provide you all the mapping tools, the arbitration, the scheduling, build everything where you will be responsible just for exploration. So a company provides you all of those evaluation capabilities. Task graphs can be used, you know, as you saw earlier, can be used in a variety of applications and Visual Sim, a product is used in all of these to evaluate those task graphs. With this, I'd like to wrap up our presentation and now I'm open to uh, answering any questions.